Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 155, Snack Time, talking game night snacks and food etiquette. As always, it's not just me, but we've got the Tabletop Bellhop himself as well. I am Mo Tuzano, the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, answering your gaming and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Remember, we record live Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop. So this week, I dived deep into the question pile and pulled out our oldest question, which happened to be one about snacks at the game table. So after an open discussion about that, we're going to move on to a preview of That Didn't Happen, a time-traveling card game. We wrap up with more thoughts on Land vs. Sea, more Adventuria, and first thoughts on Walking in Burano. Welcome to the Suggestion Box. Here we highlight some of our interactions with you fine folk. We saw a lot of comments on our content this past week, especially on our Games for a High Schooler to Toss into a Backpack topic from two weeks ago. Here are just some of the highlights, starting with a comment from our patron of the show, Kevin Renault, on our Stuffing a Calax with the Family Games topic. Now, I like your choices, but I haven't played Bonanza. I would switch it up with point salad and probably stuff take the gold in there as well. Well, thanks, Kevin. Um, I really need to try out point salad as I n- haven't heard anything bad about that game at all. And you really need to try bean. I actually thought you played it with me at the one birthday party we had at the CG Realm. I know you were there and we played Gizmos together. You must have missed out on the Bonanza game. That was, Everyone was in that Bonanza game. Yeah, I, that's I what I was thinking it. too. That's, that's why Kevin wasn't. I don't know where Kevin was at that point. Maybe he showed up late. I'm not sure. As for, uh, what is it? Take the gold. That one, I don't even know of. So I, I'm going to have to look that one up before I finish the show notes to even see what that one's about. Well, next, Mike Z commented on our Anachrony Big Box Unboxing to say, this will be coming to our game table in coming weeks. Mind Clash has produced quite a huge system with this Anachrony, and the Mm -hmm. modularity in this game does work. It's a cumbersome cumbersome setup, and while the organizer looks good, it's not super functional, and the Mm -hmm. box is still a lot of wasted space. Well, I'm sad to hear about the uh, ongoing organization problem with uh, Anachrony. Since unboxing my Kickstarter upgrade kit, which is uh, what the unboxing is on YouTube, I actually still haven't taken the time to get all the stuff from my original game into the new box. I just haven't found time to do it yet. It's it's not a game that we played a lot. It's a, it's a, as he mentioned, a little bit of a uh, effort to set up, and it becomes kind of an epic game night when we're going to play that one. And I hate teaching it. It is a ter- it is a bear to teach because you kind of have to front load everything. So I haven't even tried it yet. But I got to say, looking at it, it's got to be better than tons of little baggies or plano boxes. Thanks for the comment, Mike. Well, next we have an informative comment on our Zaya box insert build video. Now, Doug Hall writes, thank you for your video. FYI, their website addresses your observation on the box lift fit. Note. If you own an earlier edition of Zaya Legends of Drift system with the thicker card ship mats, you will need to place some of these in three rows on top of everything else. This will give a very small amount of lid lift, but still keeps all the game components in place. Thanks, Doug. Um, I was wondering about that since all of my new content, all the stuff I got from the last Kickstarter, I don't even know it's the last, maybe it's two Kickstarters, but the last Kickstarter I backed, for Zaya, which introduced some new mission packs and stuff, and the um, the big expansion, Empires of a Forsaken Sun. Wow, it's been a while. Embers of a Forsaken Star, I think it's called. Um, and the Cell Sword all featured these thinner shipboards, and I actually just thought they kind of cheaped out on the expansion. I didn't realize that was actually a printing, like a later printing issue. I have no idea what printing my game is, but obviously it's got to be one of the older ones. Now, I am glad to see that Folded Space has addressed this on their website, at least. And I got to say, while the box fit isn't a big issue, it would have been nice if everything just fit a little bit more snug. Fair. Well, next, CGE noticed our Galaxy Trucker 2021 unboxing <clears throat> video and commented. Thank you for your unboxing and comments. Enjoy the game and let us know your feedback. Yeah, with everything going on lately, I still haven't gotten this new edition of Galaxy Trucker to the table, but I am looking forward to playing for it. Thanks for the comment. Check games editions. Well, Andre Thanhauser 
had quite a bit to say about our Veil Dancer Hero set review. The henchmen of this box do fit well in the Nidheim, uh, Nidheim adventure, being part sure. of the Harem of the Sultan. Sultan, I don't get your critiques concerning the content of this adventure. In Germany, all Aventuria boxes are age 14 plus, while only this box is 18 plus. While in my opinion, most of that content is rather absurd than really erotic, I would have expected more details to really make it 18 plus. To me, it was a good decision, while compared to movies, etc., 16 plus would still have been reasonable. I agree that the mechanic of that twist from one fight to the other is quite genius. Very happy with how each Aventuria adventure has some unique mechanisms. Well, thanks for the comments, Andre. Um, I think what we have here is just a case of cultural differences between Germany and Canada specifically, and possibly something you wouldn't even see in the U.S. Because when I see 18 plus and I see a veil dancer, someone doing, you know, the dance of nine veils or whatever, I expect like tales of the Arabian nights and sexy stuff that goes with it, not gore, violence and BDSM. That was my issue with the content, not that it was rated for adults or was overly sexual. It's just that I was expecting sexy and not slaughter. <laughs> Indeed. Now, all right, back on to some of those backpack games comments. Huh. First off, Joseph Gru writes, deck games would be good. Timeline, Uno, poker. Now, Riley Marshall says, my friends mostly played card games. President, several kinds of rummy, hearts, poker, blackjack. Crazy Eights, Spoons, if we could collect a bunch of plastic cutlery from the cafeteria when I was in high school, because it was easy and I had a collection of decks of cards. There were a lot less restrictions at that point, though, I think. I remember Yu-Gi-Oh! being banned in at least one school I went to, and I hadn't started collecting my own games much yet. Nowadays, yeah, any game that's relatively simple to learn and small and has sturdy enough pieces, I take the dice version of Fleet, Sushi Go Party, and Rhino Hero on most trips. My one friend usually packs Hive and then a couple of other small games. Dicey Goblins comes to mind. Nice. Now Dyson Logos chimed in with, weirdly, Monopoly Deal, the deck game, is pretty solid. We keep hearing that. I still never actually managed to get oh. a hold of a copy. <laughs> uh, Jay Barons adds Silver and Gold. It's a great quickie game, takes about 15 to 20 minutes, and we usually end the night playing this once or twice. Now Luke Shearus notes, there's also Roll For It and any of the Paco Games series. Fair. And we've got Mark from Grand Gamers Guild commented, Scroop and Pocket Ops are perfect size and price point for a backpack game. I gotta admit, I didn't check to see if those are actually games Grand Gamers Guild I'm... publishes or if it's <laughs> someone else, but I'm guessing I'm those guessing are probably from Mark. Than... Fair enough. I'll, I'll let I'll let you plug it. You get you brought us Garento. I'll let you get away with it. And finally, Sean Hamilton, not me from Hamilton, writes, "Ooh, I actually had a friend ask me a similar question not that long ago, maybe a week or so. They asked me for easy to pack and learn games to bring with them on a trip. Anything in a small box, I think, with bonus points if it's easily accessible to new players. Mm -hmm. Fleet comes to mind, but only because I'm currently playing a lot of it." It may or may not be a thing people are interested in. It's probably at the top end of what intro level yeah. could be considered, if not past it, but I think it could be teachable enough. But really, anything in a similar box to that would be good, ideally with plasticized, sleeved, protected components for the safety of the game. Also, any box that's over-engineered to protect its components. That's the one place where those metal tins actually look pretty good. I just say, wow, that's, that is an awesome amount of feedback on one particular topic. I don't know if we've ever gotten that much feedback on one specific thing, let alone all our content during the week. So that was pretty sweet. Um, what I'll do is I'll try to make sure to have links to every single one of these mentioned games in the show notes when I put those out on Tuesday. So thank you, Sean, Mark, Luke, Jay, Dyson, Riley, and Joe. All right, well, let's finish off on a super high note with this comment from Jay Feast on our latest YouTube video. Haven't commented in a while, but y'all make a great show. Thanks. Well, thanks so much, Jay. I, that's the kind of stuff we love to hear and what keeps us coming back week after week. Well, that's it for this week's comments. Send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com or hit us up on social media.
We've got a few announcements to get to this week before we move on to our main topic. All right, number one. Pretty much your last chance to enter to win a retail copy of Roll Camera, especially for those of you listening to this on the day it comes out on your podcaster. Now, that contest ends on the 24th of November, one week from today on Wednesday at midnight Eastern Standard Time. And what we'll probably do is draw the winner on our after show after our podcast recording that late, assuming we go past midnight, which sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. To enter, head over to the blog and check out our Roll Camera review and enter using the widget at the bottom of the page. You don't have to read the review. It's a great game. You just just go enter. You want it. Trust me. Now, I'll read the review. Stay on there long enough that my ad network is like, oh, you're looking at ads. Sorry. I, I was on Open the window, then go do something else, then come back and enter. That might work. All right. Number two, the Guild of Dungeoneering Ultimate Edition we announced last week. The giveaway for that is now live. Head to the blog and enter to win one of two Steam codes for this roguelike tile laying and deck building game where you are the one building the guild hall and the dungeon. Due to the fact there's nothing to ship, we're very pleased to open this giveaway to the entire world. Well, as long as you have access to Steam, then you can play. Good luck to everyone who enters both or either of these contests. So number three, I am pleased to announce that voting is now open in the RPG Geek 24-hour RPG contest. So RPG Geek is the role-playing side of Board Game Geek, a site we mention all the time on the show. Now, this is a yearly game design contest in which participants only have 24 hours to fully design and basically publish a tabletop role-playing game. Not only have to come up with a concept, play test it, and do all that, they also have to put it in some kind of readable format to be published. This year, I actually decided to take part, something I haven't done since 2012. Head over to RPG Geek Forums to download the 12 entries in a convenient zip file and then send a ranked list to Rob with six Bs on RPG Geek. (laughs) Don't worry. Rob, I guess. I don't know. (laughs) Uh, Don't worry. We'll put links to the forum page, the zip file, and Rob's account in the show notes. Now, while it would be fantastic if everyone just went there and ranked my game, Droids, the Unsung Heroes of Sci-Fi, to the top of their list, what I really want is for people to check out all of the awesome games these indie designers managed to come up with over such a short period of time. All right, and uh, we dropped those links right there into the chat for uh, those folks, and they'll be in the show notes as well. We're here to answer your game, gaming, or game night questions. Tonight, we deep dive into our question pile to find the question that's at the bottom of the pile. The oldest question on our list. It comes from Binks Games, who wrote, My game night question is, what is your snack of choice? Is it the same as your game group? Well, thanks so much for your question, Binks Games. Now, Binks Games is an indie game publisher whose first ever game was Pulsar Event, and who recently launched a new game called Buy It or Don't, an adult party game. You can find their stuff at binksgames.com, B-I-N-K-S-G-A-M-E-S. So this is a pretty simple question, and it's one we have actually answered in one form or another on various AMAs. Now, we also in the past did go into quite a bit of detail on the topic of food etiquette. That goes way back to episode 25, uh, which we named Blue Plate Special. Now, the focus there was on dinner. What do you do for dinner? Who arranges dinner? Who holds the pizza and stuff like that? So what I thought we'd do tonight was, again, focus mainly on, mainly on snacks due to that's what the Binks Games question is, but also expand on it. There's a few. I want to dive deeper than just finding out what our, what our favorite snacks are. We can cover that on an AMA, but I want to go into a little bit more detail tonight. So let's start off with the actual question first. So, Binks wants to know, Sean, what's your snack of choice for game night, and is it the same as the people you game with? Which I think, in your case, in most cases, is your kids. I say, you know, until very recently, I was all about the potato chips when it came to snacking. But alas, due to some digestive reasons, and because almost every potato chip flavor now includes lactose injected into it or something, mm-hmm. uh, I have pivoted to more pretzel-based snacks. Uh, my kids tend to be split between pretzels and popcorn 
But as smart food is generally the popcorn of choice, it is particularly bad for getting everywhere and on everything. That white powder cheddar is it, it nasty. Is, it is bad. Now, I think smart food is a Canadian thing. I think I remember mentioning it before, having the Americans confused. But smart food is this white cheddar popcorn that by the time you're eating, your fingers are two inches thicker because the stuff just like coats everything. Yeah. And it's kind of like drywall. <laughs> it just kind of gets it is. everywhere. I mean, the people who love it love the flavor, but the actual topping just does not it adheres to to the uh the touch. Yes. So I, I do admit, try I, to I do try to encourage pretzels whenever possible. Fair. I do enjoy smart food, but like you, that is not one I'm gonna break out at a game night. Now, similarly, for me, it has changed over time, right? Uh, for years and years, um, it was a particular brand of chocolate bar, uh, which we called the Spider Butter Bar because it was a Berdarachid in French, which would always look like butter for arachnids. Um, it wasn't. It was just silly. And it was the O. Henry peanut butter flavor, which I don't even know if they make anymore. I haven't seen one in years. Like going down the aisles at Costco or Shoppers, you know, they have the impulse buys. I have not seen one in years, so I'm guessing this is dead. There was that. There were combos because the problem with the, the, the spider butter bar, I buy one or two from like 7-Eleven and eat them generally quickly. Whereas just snacking during play, it was always combos. I still to this day love combos. Combos are my favorite savory snack. And well, Jolt Cola uh, was the thing. Um, I am pretty sure I owe a lot of my digestive problems now to the sheer amount of Jolt Cola and other colas that I drank by the can, by the case, uh, back in my teens. Indeed. Now, yeah. We, we even yeah. actually managed to get a hold of Kick, which wasn't yes. actually legal for sale in Canada for various obscure legislative reasons, uh, but it was essentially Mountain Dew with the amount of caffeine of Jolt yes. or more. Oh, I used to love that stuff. I did. I, the Kick was amazing. I, anytime I went over to the States, I would pick up a, a six or 12 or 24 pack of kick if I could. There was also surge was another one I remember getting. And I don't remember what exactly that we, we wanted the high caffeine cola. I liked the taste of caffeine. I still enjoy, I, if I had an option to drink a jolt right now, instead of this coffee, I'd be doing it. I should have. Now, if those weren't available, because especially combos for some reason, I don't know if it's a Canadian thing, are just hard to find. Like, like certain specific places have them, but they're not readily available. And while Jolt was always difficult to find. So if you couldn't get that, I, I was chips or pretzels. Now, specifically not, I, I actually prefer plain chips. Like, I, I know it's, it's a travesty. Everyone's got their flavor, fl favorite flavor. But for me, it was always just plain Lay's chips were always my favorite. Now, honestly, nothing. Like, like for game night, I don't, we don't snack generally at all. Uh, what it is though, is we prefer to get together as a group and have a meal sitting down just the meal before play, which usually means by the time we're sitting down playing, we're all quite full and not really interested in snacking anymore. Yeah. And this is really kind of the ideal. And we've talked about this before on episodes and AMAs uh, for me with the kids, our gaming is usually pre dinner. So uh, we stop when and go make and eat, make or eat dinner when the game is over or when the hunger has hit that level where there's no real choice to focus or eat. Eating must happen. You got to worry about the kids getting hangry while they're playing. At least yeah. I do. That's one of the reasons I don't play with my kids on an empty stomach. <laughs> and sometimes when we play over at uh, these moms, if dinner goes a little late, you can always tell. Right. Now, uh, as for my game groups right now, uh, it's eat together beforehand. Uh, usually we order from a locally owned restaurant or we get takeout or delivery one way or one way or another. And if there's any snacking, it's usually leftovers, right? Like we, we'll get pizza or whatever. And then, you know, halfway through the nights, it kind of hits and people walk over to the, the pizza box and still have some left in. Now, back in the day, though, my groups, the rule used to be you bring your own snacks of choice and you share. It's whatever you bring. It doesn't even have to be everyone likes it, but you have to be willing to share. And what would happen is people would show up and they would just dump it on the table. Now I got a big table, so it's easy to do that and not get in the way of the game. And most of the time back then we were playing role-playing games. So the center of the table wasn't like the place the board had to be. And well, people would help themselves. Uh, popular items that were a little unusual included packs of Oreos. Someone would always bring a pack of Oreos. Um, I don't, again, I think this is a Canadian thing, but the McCain chocolate cake, 
that's in a tin. Those were popular. And chips of various flavors. Chips were always popular. Cheese. How have you not yet, at this point in this discussion, mentioned cheese? <laughs> okay, cheese is what I like to snack on, but I don't usually snack on it during play. I, 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 was not I really a... There are a number of Saturdays at the university where I beg to differ. You would bring a brick right. of cheese to ro to role playing, and as the GM, you would be sitting there not only eating it, but you would also be accepting it as bribes from players. Yeah. <laughs> okay, there was a cheese phase in there. I still like cheese. I also remember showing up with a summer sausage and like a knife, just yep. carving off chunks yep. and eating it. That, those were our trail rations. <laughs> Yeah, okay. So role playing there with cheese. I do. I eat a lot of cheese as a snack. That's my favorite nighttime snack. I gotta take I gotta eat something with my pill um before I go to bed. And it's often cheese with a few crackers. Crackers is another big one. Actually, I kind of miss that. I, I eat a lot of crackers. Though I love pretzels and I love crackers and I love combos. I do not love the cracker combos. Those are bad. Mm -hmm. You need yep. the pretzel combos. Those the the pre the, the cracker combos. Just absorb all of the liquid from your body yes um and you you know your eyes dry out as you're eating them it's something strange well, I'm, I'm not he's, he's not wrong so yeah the, the, definitely the cheese that's definitely a thing so th those are generally our preference right uh like right now if we were gonna have a game night uh the other thing <laughs> the amusing one this time of year there's more snacks at my table because there's all the halloween candy my kids won't eat gets put into a wooden bowl that sits in the center of the table, which is often still there when Sean comes down for New Year's Eve because there'll be little bits left. And um, that is definitely the favorite of uh, Sean Hamilton, not Sean from Hamilton, and my regular Monday night group eating some of the most horrid, no-name brand, rubbery or hard candy stuff from the bowl, which some of that becomes kind of a challenge to see who will eat what. So there is that. But that's like a seasonal thing. That's seasonal snacking that just helps get rid of the leftover Halloween Fair candy enough. that we have. All right. Next, I want to talk a bit about rules for snacks at the game table. I, I'd say written or unwritten here because some people do have a formal document for their their house their house rules, their rules of the house. Um, or they establish something during session zero. So it's fair enough. A, a social contract, written or unwritten. Do you have any rules for the kids when playing games besides no smart food? Uh, wipe your hands. That's pretty much it. Uh, right. My kids are water drinkers, so I don't have to worry as much about spills. And I admit it, and, and I'm still shocked. <laughs> he has never actually yelled at me. I am a coffee on the table guy. Um, so I, I can't really talk. I do tend towards chunkier mugs that, yep. that slide before they ever get knocked over. But I, I am a coffee on the table guy. I admit it. Yeah, we've talked about that one before. I, I didn't really get into drinks when I was writing the show notes here. It was I was thinking food snacks. But yeah, side tables, we have them. Just got to <laughs> ask. We got four down in the basement. We can kind of scatter them around the table. But yeah, the, the big thing, uh, as I mentioned back on episode 25, and we kind of mentioned here as well, uh, meals are away from the game table. Like if you are going to, or or you clear off the game table, you have a meal, then you break the game. So either, either you do it somewhere else or you do it on, like on a clean table. But as for snacks, they're welcome. I, I My personal request, though, is unless you're playing a role-playing game where everything's your own, right? You've got your own dice, your own pencil, your own character sheet, your base and only touching your own stuff. I want people to stay away from sick, sticky, saucy, powdery foods. Now, I am perfectly fine if you're playing D&D &D and all you touch is your own stuff and you want to mow down on some Cheetos and Doritos. It's your character sheet. And I, I, we have a friend who has some pretty epic character sheets by the end of uh you know two years worth of play and 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 the marks on that sheet could tell stories um so i just ask people avoid them when playing a game with shared components if you have shared components and there's lots of components handling going on especially cards cards are specifically if you're playing any kind of card game um there's a reason the bicycle cards are plasticized <laughs> most board games don't go to that level of easy to clean up so that's the biggest thing for me is is avoid any, I think everyone knows what I mean by, by sticky, saucy, powdery foods. And even if you are avoiding that, keep some paper towels handy. Yes. <laughs> oh, and one that Sean likes to point out that I always forget to tell people is point out where the garbage is as well. Know where to put the refuse from Especially your Especially if you've got, you know, cutesy, hidden away garbage that out of out of sight, out of mind. 
Yes, uh, we have a the, the same friend who liked to squirrel things on our bookshelf. Uh, though I think he knew where the garbage was. <laughs> so yeah, keep your keep your towels handy. Uh, as Sean said, wipe up. You know, do something between snacks. Now, one of the things that now exists that gamer the video gamers have developed the chopstick thing. Maybe if you get a set of those, you could eat some Cheetos. I don't know if you've seen those yet. They slip over your fingers. No, and yeah. so you can still use your hands to play, but you have these like chopsticks on the end to grab. Oh, I was Cheetos. just thinking having chopsticks nearby. I'm like, I always have well, chopsticks, chopsticks would also work, right? <laughs> like that way your hands don't get dirty. And then um, the other thing too is, is uh, that you totally, in my opinion, want to avoid are dips. I have never, ever played a game or had dips at a table where at least one dollop didn't hit the table. It doesn't matter how careful you are, what you're trying to do. It always hits something, splatters on the table between the plates, your hand, when putting, scooping stuff onto your plate, when you're just dipping right from the bowl, whatever it happens to be. I have never had a dip out where something didn't hit the table. And while if there's games there, it's going to hit the games and not the table. Yep. Uh, we, we had some chatter in the Discord about dips, uh, specifically in the, the uh, pandemic era, how, mm. you know, dips should that? go onto plates. And, and, and so you've got your own personal plate with some dip on or bowl with some dip on it. And then you can sort of do the, do the, you know, ramen style dip and chip yep. eating, but that's, yeah, that really, I know still, you got the plate, it's putting it on the plate. You do that. There's still that, the, 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 the liquid is traveling at some point <laughs> over the table. Maybe you go put it in another room, like over off to the side and then you put it on your plate, but then someone, you know, I don't know puts their plate on the table and someone rolls some dice and they plop into the dip. I, I, dips are bad. Like I like dips, but again, save those, save those for before or after the game, in my opinion. So next let's spend a bit of time talking about where these snacks are coming from. Who should be the one providing the snacks for game night? And straight up, I got to say, it shouldn't necessarily be the host of the event or the game master when talking about role-playing games. If someone is inviting you into their house to play games with them and they're doing all the work leading up to that event, like cleaning up, picking out games, getting games ready to play, teaching you the games, or on the RPG side, spending their off time prepping the games, shopping for miniatures, creating scenery, creating dungeons, the least the other players can do is either bring snacks for everyone, including the host, or bring their own snacks so as to relieve that burden from the host. There's enough other stuff going on that the host has to worry about. Plus, providing snacks is a great way of saying thank you to the work these people are doing and the opportunity to share playing games with them. Absolutely. So if the host is throwing a dinner party and the guests are the one bringing the games, then we can talk about doing something else. But mm -hmm. if the host is hosting the games, then... No, absolutely. Uh, you, there's no reason that they need to do everything uh, food involved as well yes. as make sure you are entertained. Yeah, that should, to me shouldn't be part of it. And I, I realize it's kind of a trope and a thing that's built over up over the years, especially in the role playing scene. That everything is on the DM. That needs to stop. It's way too much work for one player. Remember, it's supposed to be fun for everyone at the table. Now, methods I've used over the years for deciding who brings snacks includes everyone brings something to share with everyone else. That's my default is you bring what you like. If someone else likes it, you can share. If someone doesn't like it, well, then they'll eat the other people's stuff. Another one is taking turns like this week at you, this week at you, this week at you, this week at you. But in that case, you probably want to make sure you're bringing something everyone enjoys. Another is everyone brings their own snacks and they're theirs, they're, they're mine. And you snack on your own. That way you don't have to worry about someone not liking something or anything else. Now, one of the ones I did back in the day to get people to start bringing snacks, and it actually kind of set, it did a Pavlov thing. So the, like I did this for D&D &D 4E, and I would provide players with in-game bonuses for bringing snacks. Now, this was a, a whole thing I did with a bunch of other things you got rewarded points for, and then you rolled on a D1000 table to get a bonus you could use in-game. And it was based on all kinds of stuff, like helping the DM or tracking tracking initiative. But one of them was bringing snacks. Well, all those players got to the point where they always brought snacks because they wanted this roll on the table. But then when we stopped playing D&D, &D, they still kept bringing snacks. So that worked awesome. That just like set it up for that. And I didn't provide snacks. I was a DM. I was the one with the table handing out in-game rewards. 
Now, I've also seen other groups that make a snack pool where they kind of pool their money and purchase at bulk at Costco, which I think is a kind of interesting idea. And of course, there's the people who love to host and just take over all the food and snacking. And there's games where everyone's expected to be full when they show up. And if they want a snack, save it for some other time. Yeah. As we've said for many topics, work it out in advance. If you leave it for people to just work out in some unspoken manner, oh, we're having a game night and don't even mention snacks, people will be disappointed. Even if they are polite enough to say it, someone will be expecting something if it's not said explicitly. Yeah, very true. It's the same thing we've said a million times, right? Set expectations. It is something to think of, right? If you're setting up a game night, especially for the first time, figure out what you're doing for this before you figure out everything else. Like, don't just show up expecting something and don't be disappointed if what you expect is there if you haven't talked about it. All right, finally, let's talk about the best snacks for game nights. What do you recommend? Well, these days, as much as my younger self would probably disown me for saying so, (laughs) go with healthier options. Not only because they are healthier, but often because they are less messy. messy. Mm -hmm. Uh, Something like uh, yogurt yogurt covered raisins or uh, dried fruit, uh, cut up some veggies. There's no reason to reinforce the horribly unhealthy Mountain Dew Doritos stereotypes and pizza. As we did when we were younger. So right now, man, Mountain Dew and Dorito sounds fantastic. <laughs> Talking about all this. Uh, one of the ones I see recommended the most by people are um, baby carrots. Because you can just put a bowl of them out. But then you get your dip thing. So I don't know about the dip thing. If you avoid dip, I'm fine with just eating baby carrots. They've got a I gotta admit. The crunch of baby carrots is part of what's good about it. I, I gotta admit, part of me is like, when it's game night, that's when you like let the other stuff go. And you're like, no, no, it's game night. I, this is the night I splurge. This is the night. And be honest that's kind of what we do with the the eating out is this is the this is when we get the good food from the local places it's probably not really the thing kind of they're they're, um sometimes foods not uh all the times foods and again uh for me basically what i said before avoid sticky saucy powdery things anything that coats your fingers and then can coat game components and again i mentioned dips i personally think are horrible uh no matter how careful you are someone's gonna drop drip something somewhere now, as for personal favorites, pretzels are definitely one of my favorites. Um, there's lots of different types of pretzels out there from sticks to twists to things stuffed with different things to mustard flavored and so on. Uh, personally, we've been sticking with a brand lately called Neo Brothers. It's the one we've been enjoying the most. They're really thick sticks and they're really crunchy. Another one that's good for not getting anywhere is licorice, uh, whether that's just little squares of licorice or it's strips or whatever. So I do warn you, if you are playing with anyone with maturity level, like my friends, someone's going to get whipped with a licorice whip at some point at my table. Now, some of those combos and some of the pretzels I've noticed are stuffed with peanut butter, which did remind me of something that I hadn't originally put in the notes, but I threw in here because I didn't want to forget to mention it, is also something very, very important whenever considering snacks for game night, and that is taking into account allergies both your own, of course, but also other people's. Some people can't even be in the room with their allergen without having a problem. This is something we deal with in our game nights because um, Sean Hamilton, not Sean from Hamilton, has a specific allergy, which I don't know if he cares if I mention or not, but I won't just in case, that if it's just in the room with him, he will get a massive headache, which he'll just end up with game night ending sooner rather than later. And while it's generally understood these days, if you are doing any sort of snack pooling or bringing bringing snacks for other people, uh, ask about uh, dietary preferences. There are, could be vegans, pescatarians, mm-hmm. vegetarians, and a- any others that I'm not familiar with out there. Um, and, you know, don't just say, well, I like meat, so you don't get to eat. That, that's just not okay. No, I agree. Also uh, religious. You don't want to bring pork to certain game nights, for example. No, no meat on on Friday night game nights. Yeah, um, a thing for some people. It, it was a thing for well, it was a thing for Catholics for a while, but they fixed that thankfully. Do they? That's not a thing anymore. No, I don't think so. I, I'm like I don't know. I know the fish and local fish and chip places seem to no. <laughs> at least act like it's still a thing. Yeah, I don't know. Well, that's about it for our talk 
about the burden placed on the game teacher. No, wow, that's about it on our talk about the burden placed on the GM having to put out food on the table on the game night. That one was in blue. I, I don't, I don't, it, it should have got edited. My bad. I even, edited yeah, the that's next it one. for our talk on snacks. Talk on snacks and who should bring snacks and what snacks you should bring. Yeah, and make it simple. Just like eat beforehand. That, that's that's all uh, anymore. Um, though I get it. Like I said it, it used to be for years. The 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 it's Saturday night. It's time to relax and let go and eat the horrible foods and drink the horrible drinks. And as we got older, those became a different type of horrible drink. But it was a thing. Well, Remember, it also used to be we would go for hours and hours. I mean, well, we would yeah. game game for eight hours. More more than twelve. We started at noon <laughs> yeah. and often wrapped up after midnight. So I mean, you needed to eat at that point, but yes. you didn't necessarily need to snack as much as we did. No, we didn't even get into big bite hot dogs from Seven Eleven and how healthy those must have been. Remember, if you've got a game or game night question for us, head over to the website, click on Ask the Bellhop. Welcome to a preview of This Didn't Happen, a time-traveling card game coming to Kickstarter in early 2022. Thank you, Island of Bees, for sending us this prototype to check out. We mainly reviewed this game just so people would stop saying you're not about the new hotness. No, I'm joking. This Didn't Happen was designed by John Heffernan, an indie game designer out of Calgary, Alberta, here in Canada. It features artwork from Z. Miguel, John plans to launch a Kickstarter in early 2022 for This Didn't Happen, and will be printing the game under his own company, Island of Bees, if it hits its funding target. Now, This Didn't Happen plays one to four players, with games taking from as little as 15 minutes, if you really mess up the time stream, to about an hour. Please be aware that this review is based on a prototype of This Didn't Happen. While the game has been fully developed and playtested, it is possible that the components and rules could change by the time the game is published. So this didn't happen as a cooperative card game where you take on the role of, a t- of time travelers trying to stop the apocalypse. This is done by traveling to various spots on the timeline spread over three eras. The medieval era, the great war era, and the lunar era. You'll need to work together to research the timeline, collect resources, and intervene during key events in order to shift the timeline in your favor. Be careful, though. Altering the timeline can cause a cascade of changes going forward from that point in time on, and it's very easy to do more harm than good. Normally, this is where I would point you to an unboxing video to check out the components in This Didn't Happen. But... Due to the fact that this game is a prototype and there's a chance like things like artwork, iconography, and component quality could change, we skipped doing an unboxing video for this game. Now, my prototype copy came shipped in a tuck box and consisted of just cards. Lots of two-sided cards. Now, these cards are quite glossary and slippery, which actually caused some problems during play with cards spinning on the table and revealing what was meant to be hidden information. Now, I'm pretty sure this is just due to the fact it's a prototype, and I do hope it'll be improved in the final version. Now, you get cards for three different timelines, three different eras, 12 main and three end-of-era cards for each, four characters and four character mode cards to go with them, a time machine card and a health tracker for it, a set of apocalypse cards, event cards, and paradox cards. Now, the artwork here is solid, as is the iconography, though it does take a bit to figure out exactly how you're meant to put these cards together when using them. We honestly never did quite figure out where you were supposed to put resource cards once you put them on the timeline. Which is unfortunate, as this game is supposed to be play-ready and just components really changing. Sadly, all too often we're getting these preview games that aren't quite as fully playable as their designers believe. Well, thankfully, with a Kickstarter launching and other review copies out there, they'll get enough notice from people who can see that before it hits the public and get these things fixed. Now, the rulebook for the game, interestingly, ships separately and is definitely still a work in progress. For one, it's way longer and more detailed than it needs to be and really needs an edit for clarity. The format's a bit odd as well because it's more like uh, when you get a sample chapter from a novel than a board game rulebook with like a hard, soft cover cover on it. Again, this is likely due to the fact it's a prototype at this point. Because for one, there's no way that rule book fits inside the box I got. 
Now, it's going to take you a couple of reads to figure out exactly how to play. And having the game set up in front of you is key to try to figure this game out. You're also probably going to want to head over to the Island of Bees website and look at the graphics and digital tutorials they have out there for how to set up the game and how to play. Rule books are a skill on their own, mm -hmm. and it is so frustrating to see people thinking of them as an afterthought, when really they are often the first part of a game that will set the expectations mm -hmm. and opinions for everything that comes after. So I was recently listening to the Ludology podcast, a fantastic podcast, and I heard a great tip from Professor Scott Rogers on writing rule books. He said, don't sit down and write. Don't just sit down to write a rule book. Because when people sit down to write, they tend, they feel, tend to feel they need to explain everything and they need more words than they actually do and over-explain everything. Instead, the key is to teach the game and record yourself doing so and then transcribe that into rules, which I think is a great suggestion. Absolutely. Well, now that we have some idea of what we are in for and what you should uh, be getting with a copy of That Didn't Happen, how about you give us an overview of playing? So the first hurdle in playing This Didn't Happen is setting up the game. This is quite fiddly. First, you're going to separate all the decks and shuffle them. Then you got to build the timeline, which again consists of three eras. You do this by taking all of the cards for each era and making a row five spaces long, with each space consisting of two cards stacked on top of each other in kind of a heart-shaped pattern. Now, cards should be placed so the black icons are showing and the red are hidden behind. You do this for all three eras, and you'll be left with two cards at the end that aren't used, which is a great way to add replayability to the game, so I do appreciate that. Next, each era has an end of era card that goes in the end. There's three of these. Those are randomized. You're going to put one face up, again, with the black showing, with the, the black symbol showing face up. I mean, as long as you don't box your cards while shuffling, there are certainly worse games to set up. Yeah, though it's a little awkward because you're boxing them and placing them, right? So for each spot, you place a card with the red side up, then place another card from the same deck with the black side up. So it is a matter of flip-flop, flip-flop, flip-flop. And when you are putting it away, it is a bit of a pain to put everything back to the right order. Next, you're going to determine which Apocalypse you will be facing by randomly selecting two of the Apocalypse cards and placing those so the artwork faces upright. Now, again, the cards overlap in a unique way, but it's more of a Y than a heart this time. Now, it is recommended the first time you play, you use the cards The Hungry and Monster, making your Apocalypse be The Hungry Monster. Other combinations have rules that change some aspect of how the game is played, making it harder for the players, where Hungry Monster just has symbols you need to match. No additional rules. Well, it's certainly nice to see the replayability and beginner mode right there in the goal cards, mm -hmm. as well as you mentioned in the timeline cards, giving you that replayability. Now, next, each player picks a character there are four of them and they choose which side of the character card to have face up so one has a female presenting version the other has a male presenting version of the same character and each features different skills and unique abilities now along with this players have a mode card which can be tucked under the character in two ways so depending on which side of the mode card you want to see now this contains more skills which side you choose will affect the event phase when we get to describing that now, when a character is injured, the mode card is flipped, and the character will lose one of their skills. Well, certainly flip when injured is a common enough mechanic. Yep. Next, you place the time machine with a health tracker card under it, showing the right damage level. Uh, normally, in a one-player game, it starts at eight, and you subtract two health for every additional player. So the more players you have, the less health the time machine has. Now you're going to place the time machine and all your characters on the first set of cards in the lunar timeline. You're going to kind of stack all those together with your character cards and your mode cards tucked underneath on top of the thing. And then the time machine goes in there somewhere below or above. Um, as I said, it's fiddly. And I got to say, right at this point, the first time I read to do this, I was like, no, I'm not doing this. There's no way. I went and grabbed some meeples. I actually have some nice glass meeples I got as a Christmas gift. And I went and broke those out because I don't get to use them often. Uh, you can grab meeples, pawns, components from another game, dice, pennies, whatever you happen to have. That's probably going to be a way better way to represent where your characters are. Because all of the stacking of cards is just too fiddly. And it's even worse that when you're there, you now have to move them. So what if the third character in the stack is now moving somewhere else? You need to unpile that stuff to get the third. 
it's just a mess and it just gets worse once you start playing because now you start putting cards under and over those timeline cards right so uh when you flip when injured so your player has a, is 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 binary injured and yes. then the the uh time machine has hit points yes okay that's what i was yeah. missing earlier. all right yeah so your character is injured or not and if you're injured once you're injured you end up being unconscious for the rest of that time period and you move to that end of era card but that's a little more fiddly than i want to get in this review um, if the time machine blows up, you actually get to keep playing, but then there's no way to jump through time. You're just going to progress through time again until you get stuck at that end of era. Fair enough. And now, as we were mentioning about all this stacking of cards and whether you should or shouldn't, remember that the current cards we have are also high gloss, slippery yes. cards. So yeah. not only is trying to get them stacked in the right order problematic, getting them to stay there is problematic. Yeah, like, they like to spin and shift. So next up, remember, we're still setting up the game here. You shuffle the event deck, the Paradox deck, and the three resource decks. Now, the three resource decks um, go with each of the timelines. You put those at the end of each timeline. Now you're ready to play. So the goal in a game of this didn't happen is to prevent the major apocalypse, the big apocalypse. Each two-card combination will give you a set of five symbols you need to make show to prevent the apocalypse. Now, it's your job to manipulate the timeline by intervening in some areas while protecting others to get those five symbols showing face up. Now, you do that by collecting resources and spending them at specific spots in the timeline. Now, first, you're going to have to research, though, to find out what cards you need to alter and which cards you need to protect. And then you actually have to go do the altering. When you actually make an alteration to the timeline, you swap the cards front to back. And then new red symbols will be showing. Now, if you're already getting lost, don't worry. It's confusing, <laughs> yes, but then so is time travel. Right? So here's the interesting bit. Once you've altered a card, you are going to look at every card in the future, going down the timeline towards the lunar era, towards the apocalypse, and you have to check and see if those red symbols now cards that card to be altered as well. You're going to go card by card, looking to see if any red symbols show up that match that card. And if they are, they flip. And then the next card you look at, you're looking at the red cards on the original card you flipped and the other card you flipped to see if that flips. And you end up with this big cascading chain reaction. Now, if you manage to get all of the symbols on the Apocalypse card showing in red, you win. But only if you didn't ruin the timeline while doing so. Because each of those end of the era cards shows two symbols on them. And these have to still be showing in the timeline in black in that era. So at the end of the Great War, you need to have the power symbol and the religion symbol, say. I'm just making this up the top of my head. And if you don't anymore because you altered the timeline, that flips and becomes another apocalypse. And while you can't win if there are any apocalypses, well, apocalypse side, but the uh, multiple ending of the worlds. So what the game is actually about is deducing which cards to alter which to leave alone, and which you need to protect. Everyone got it now? Clear as mud? Great. <laughs> Good to go. All right, so how you do this. You're going to do this through a number of phases, starting with the travel through time phase. This is pretty simple. Here are players in order of their position on the timeline. Either move from the time machine to any point in the timeline, or move from any point in the timeline back to the time machine, or stay where they are. So there's no flipping. This is just moving around for position for later stages. Yeah, you're just moving into position to do something later. Okay. So next is the action phase. Here's the meat of the game. Again, in order determined by the timeline, person furthest back in time goes first, which kind of makes sense because they're in what they do will affect the other players. We'll do actions. Now these actions include gathering resources, which is pretty simple, draw a resource card. Do research, which lets you look at the red symbols that are covered at any point on the timeline previous to where you are in the same era. So if you're at the end of the lunar era, you can look at, say, the start of the lunar era. Uh, you can rest, which is healing if you're injured. You flip that card we mentioned earlier. Uh, you can cache resources. This is a neat time travel thing where you can send cards to other players who are further up the timeline. That's your whole, you know, Bill and Ted, we left the thing in the thing. And now here it is, right? Um, you've got that. Uh, you can intervene in current events. And the way you do that is you're going to spend a resource card and you're going to put it under the cards on the timeline. 
Now, if the symbols on those cards ever match the symbols on the top card, it's going to flip and change the timeline. No, it might take several steps to intervene. So I could drop a resource, then Sean can come in on a later turn, drop another resource, and it's only then that it flips. Or you might drop a really big resource that causes it to flip right away. You can protect time, because when you flip that, you might not want the next one to flip over, because that'd be horrible. So what you can do instead is place your resources on top, and now you need the resources on the symbol to show, as well as the ones on the card. So the resource adds to the number of symbols you need. So it makes it harder to have that spot altered later. And then if you mess all this up and you figured it out and haven't lost yet, you can also uh, commit what's called temporal suicide, which I have learned they are going to change that name to temporal sacrifice because we don't want to make late of suicide. What this lets you do is revert a previous intervention or protection by removing all the cards that are currently there. So while there didn't seem to be all that much happening in phase one, suddenly things get busy. Yes. Now, once everyone has taken one action, you only get to do one of those things. And to be honest, when you're sitting there, it seems like that's it. That's all I get to do. It, 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 it's an odd feeling. Once you've done your one, everyone has done their one action, you're going to draw an event card. These are broken up into three areas, one for each of the three timelines. And depending on where you are on the timeline, you're going to impact that part of the event card. Now, most of these are going to have you check your character and their mode card and resources you have to see if you have the symbols that are on the event card. Now, events can be good or bad. Some events will cause you to draw a paradox card. Now, paradox cards are permanent cards that affect gameplay in some negative way for the players. A neat rule is that only one can be in play each turn, but you could have multiple paradoxes. And at the start of the turn, you actually shuffle to see which paradox is affecting you for that turn. All right. Well, I mean, there's a lot to unpack there, but really it's a lot more common easy than that second phase, which, which oh, got yeah. a little out of hand. Yes. Now, through the event phase thematically, I like the name of this, is everyone experiences history, which is just a fancy way of saying, look under the card you're standing on to see what red symbols are there. Now, note, if a player or the time machine is in an apocalypse at this point, so either in the final apocalypse or if you've got one of those apocalyptic end of an eras, you're going to take damage. If the time machine's destroyed again, no one can move through time and are just going to keep progressing each phase until they hit those end of the era. Which is the next part, which is the final phase, which is everyone moves through time. Everything shifts one space down the timeline towards the apocalypse, including the time machine. Understandable. Uh, I'd say that that makes sense, but I don't want to tell listeners how many times I have read through this script and I'm still not sure I'm getting everything. And that is exactly how I felt reading the rule book. So I, I sympathize with you. I fully understand. You kind of need it in front of you. And trust me, that first game, you're probably not going to do it right. I'm not saying play extreme. You're just not going to realize the effect of these different actions. But we'll get more into that more when we get into our thoughts. So some of the rule bits that really didn't fit in the above that I do think should be mentioned. Uh, you can only hold three resources. Resources will give characters symbols they can use for events, as well as symbols that they can use to tuck the cards to either protect or get them to flip eventually. Many resource cards also have additional rules. Every resource card seemed to be beneficial, though some did wound you for taking them, but they tended to give a good bonus. Also worth noting that once a spot on the timeline is altered due to a chain reaction, so you didn't go there and spend resources, it flipped on its own because of something you did. There is no way to take it back at all. There is no way to revert it. What's done is done. Also, there is a strong memory element to this game. When you experience the timeline or you use the research action, you get to peek, right? You get to look at the buried red symbols, but then you cover them back up before the end of the round and you're not allowed to look without researching again. And sadly, this is where it loses me. I mean, I guess I could take notes, but I'm not a fan of memory requirements in game in large part because often I'm gaming for me is social mm -hmm. uh and if you're being social during games it makes it that much harder to remember the three little red symbols on that one card you looked at three turns ago yeah even if your memory is good no i i agree with you 100 percent uh that is something that i think many groups will want to host for because if you're going to take notes anyway you may as well just be able to look at the cards so thematically i guess it might make sense so one other rule is if your character is on the timeline, on a timeline spot, when the card gets altered, so again, you weren't planning on this happening, the card gets altered from a chain reaction, 
or actually you could plan for it to happen, but it wasn't you changing the time, your character doing it. It's, it's from a change reaction. You're going to flip your character card over. And remember, they present differently and have different abilities on the other side. And what this represents is that something someone did in the past changed your birth in some way. Now, character mode can be changed at any time. That's the other card you've got tucked underneath. Again, there's some more tucking and facing. You can flip that any time, but only during the action phase, which I found a little odd. Because this means you have to decide your mode before you see the event card that's about to come up. So you're kind of gambling a bit there. Now, each character also has two special game breaking abilities. Each are based on what side your character's on. And these include all kinds of break the rule things, right? Like move around the time machine without, or timeline without using the time machine, but you damage yourself. That's the Doctor Who like character. Um, another character gets to draw two event cards and pick which one. Another gets to draw extra resource cards and so on. Each of them has, each of the four characters has two different abilities depending on which side of the card you're using. Right. So if you're caught in one of those cascades, Surprise! You're now your own son or something. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the game does not give you a distinct what happened. That's up to you if you want to do some storytelling. There you go. Now, I realize this is a lot to take in, and that's with me still trying to keep things pretty high level. I did want to mention all the different actions. Maybe I should have been a little... I don't even know. if More succinct or more vague would have been better. I've said it before, and I'll say it again. This is a fiddly game. This applies to how the mechanics work as well as the actual physical manipulation of components. In general, though, just to kind of overview, because just to, to make this make a little more sense. So you start off the game basically heading out to collect resources and experiencing the timeline, looking for the right red symbols that match your apocalypse. Eventually, you're going to find the right symbols, and now you have to start figuring out which cards you have to protect and getting people onto those cards and playing resources to basically shore them up so that when you do change timeline, you don't have side effects you didn't want then once you think you have everything right then only then do you start affecting the timeline and hope you didn't miss something there's where that memory element can come in big now while that's happening you're going to be dealing with random events and hoping the time machine doesn't blow up along the way okay well now that we've got some idea of how to play hopefully <laughs> what did you think of this didn't happen because that last bit sounded a lot like some heavy quarterbacking can occur yeah that is definitely something that is part of this game it's one of those this is a co-op where you are going to have to work together and that could lead to quarterbacking but first though i want to say learning this game was rough so first off as mentioned earlier the rule book format is a little strange it's, it's more like reading a short textbook than a board game rule book and it really could use an edit for succinctness and clarity now, normally, I can sit down and read a rule book somewhere else, which is what I did in this case. I was in a parking lot while my daughter was in for therapy, and I read the rule book. And when I got home, I was like, all right, now we're going to play. And it was like, I don't even know. I, I, I read this, but it's not making sense. And I got to say, just reading the rules did not get it across. And it wasn't until we sat down and started playing that any of it really made sense, which I'm sure is how probably most of you feel listening to my description of the game. That first game involved a lot of rule referencing. And while I got to say, everything's there in the book. It's just the format's not what you expect, and it wasn't easy to find. And it was one of those rule books where you'd find rules in weird places, like there'd be a description of the card, and then later how the card's used, and then like in the action section, but then a section in the back about, say, the time machine that finally says where your starting health should be. Like it just wasn't, it's all in there, just not easy to find. But never underestimate the power of a good rule book. Now, even when we did finally figure out how the mechanics worked, it took a couple more plays to figure out what we were supposed to do with these mechanics to have any chance of winning. Our first game was amusingly quick. As we started off, spread across the timeline, and grabbing a couple resources, then someone in the, the Old West saw one symbol we needed, and we're like, oh, they did a research action. Like, we need that symbol. We quickly did everything we could to alter that timeline card, which was in the medieval era. It was like the first or second card. And then we flipped it, and almost every single card in the entire tableau was affected. The one just flipped the next one, and that flipped the next one, and then this one was flipped because the second one was flipped. And by the time we got to the second era, all the symbols were up three times. It was just over. 
And to be honest, the total play time for that game was probably about 15 minutes and 10 minutes of that was set up and explaining the rules. Like the setup was longer than the game. You killed your grandfather, didn't you? That's yeah, something. We we caused. I can't remember now, but like the 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 Axis uh, won the war. I forget what happened in the medieval times. I think the paladin was slain. Like because there's there's like a description of what happens to each of these. The lunar era. I think the robots took over. Like it, we had all four apocalypses happened. We we had no chance chance whatsoever. And it honestly took a few more plays before we started to grok. The deduction aspects of this game, which is something I missed, like reading the rules and looking it up online and hearing it's a half hour game. I expected something a little light. It's not about jumping around, changing things and seeing what happens. It's actually about careful research, figuring out exactly what you need to change and what you have to do to make sure other things don't change. It's only once we discovered that key aspect of play, that the game actually started to be more fun. So I got to admit, the, the first crash was kind of amusing. Now that we know how the game should be played, it's actually way easier for me to introduce the game to new players and for setting expectations before we start playing. Letting players know this is a puzzle. This is a deduction and memory game with some interesting random elements. And this is not a game about playing around to see what happens. Is very important to getting people to enjoy this game. Yeah, just seeing what happens in history is how you get Black Mirror even sooner. Now, jumping back to that memory element, we kind of mentioned a bit here. This is the one part of the game that I'm not a huge fan of, but one that's easily fixed. While I get that thematically it makes sense, you may forget your research or forget what happened to you in the past, adding a memory element to what's already a difficult puzzle can be too much, especially with younger players. I actually recommend playing without this rule while you're learning to play the game. Only introduce it once you've actually managed to save the timeline a few times. Or for those with lousy memories, take notes. Fair. Now, my biggest complaint about this didn't happen is just how fiddly everything is. The turn order even feels fiddly. There's just something about the fact where you travel, you travel, you travel, you travel. Okay. Now you do an action, you do an action, you do an action, you do an action. Okay. Now everyone gets an event. Okay. It just feels weird. And I don't know. It just seems like it'd be much easier to have one player do all of it. So you travel, take an action, deal with an event, experience time, move forward, next player, go. That just seems more succinct and easy to me. Now, maybe it's just me that I'm used to other games where players tend to take all their actions in one action, especially the move, then do something. Maybe if you just put those two phases together, it would feel more comfortable to me. But for some reason, it just feels weird. It just like adds to the, the awkwardness of the game. Yeah, it does feel like a somewhat older way of doing things. Uh, not quite outdated but leaning a little bit in that direction compared to modern yeah. games. Uh, we also thought the fact you have to choose your mode in the action phase when it affects you in the event phase a little weird. So I got to admit that was only at first. Once we started to see how resources give you more skill symbols, shifting your mode made more sense. You're like, whoa, I have a gun. I don't need as many fist symbols now because I have a gun, so I can switch my mode over to my investigative side instead of my stealth side or whatever. And I guess it's thematic that you wouldn't know what events are coming. Yeah, no, time travel is mysterious to the best of us. <laughs> now, as mentioned earlier, a lot of this fiddliness comes from the components themselves. The way you stack cards in this game. Well, effective as a way to show information, the whole parts and why it kind of shapes, it's just strange and weird. Uh, then you get into the whole stacking multiple cards at one location which could be a ton of stuff. You got two timeline cards, a character card with their mode card, the time machine with its health card, any number of resources, cards either stacked below or above it. Now, a chunk of this is easy to fix, right? Just do what I suggested earlier, grab some type of counter. And to be honest, that's even suggested in the rules. But I got to say, it seems really strange to me that something that makes that big of an impact and improvement on gameplay just isn't included. This is something I really hope comes out during the Kickstarter. Um, either from fan feedback or maybe as a stretch goal or something, a way to include a time machine mini or character miniatures or meeples or literally pawns in different colors that are colorblind friendly would be awesome. Yeah. And again, high gloss cards, hard to stack. Where's the linen finish that would allow these to have a little bit of grip? 
Yeah, and I, I really do think that's a prototype issue. Um, some of the bleed on the cards isn't great, and some of the cutting's not even perfect. I think that's just... I don't actually know where this came from, if it's drive through cards or Game Crafter, or the, it could be the designer cut them themselves. I don't know. Yeah. I, I really do think that's something that will be improved. So that's actually not a concern of mine at this point, but yeah. Now, with my particular copy, it can be frustrating. Now, okay. I realize this sounds like a lot of negatives. But the thing is, a lot of these problems can be cleaned up with a good solid edit of the rules, some better clarity on how to manage the cards, graphical examples of how to stack things, and possibly the inclusion of counters and tokens. Hidden under all this fiddliness is a rather solid and engaging game. Once everything clicked in place, both with how each of the actions and phases work, as well as once we figured out how we should be using those actions, we found a rather fun game. The deduction aspects are interesting, with players spreading out over the timeline, experiencing time, learning what symbols are hidden where, collecting resources for dealing with events, and eventually affecting the timeline. And I got to say, that moment when you do finally make your first change in the timeline and slowly begin flipping over the cards and moving card to card, trying to see if you caused a chain of effects you didn't expect, is very tense and really engaging. Everyone's standing up at this point, leaning over the table. Then that feeling you get when you got it right, you did all the right things, you didn't cause a new apocalypse to happen, is a wonderful feeling. Of course, this is surprising when you finally do manage to prevent the final apocalypse and keep all the errors intact. It's even more enjoyable. And there's even joy in putting the plan together, acting it out, and watching it work. And there's even fun to see when it fails miserably. So it sounds like, really, for the right people, this game has a solid potential. I do agree. It's going to take different, different gamers are going to take to this. This is not going to be a, a big hit. Everyone's going to get it. Everyone should own it. Definitely not. Because overall, despite being a bit of a fiddly mess that took quite a bit of time to fully figure out, we're now really enjoying this didn't happen. It's more of a cooperative puzzle to solve than a game. And that's not a bad thing. Figuring out what aspects of your timeline have to be changed in order to prevent an apocalypse can be a lot of fun. Just be sure you have some meeple or something on hand to represent your character, just to save some of that card manipulation hassle. Very fair. So, of course, the big question here is, should you back? This didn't happen when it launched on Kickstarter. Or, assuming it funds, pick it up once it's released to the public. And I gotta say, it depends. I hate using it depends, but it really depends on you and your group. Now, I say you and your group because, or your group, I should say you or your group, because this game actually plays extremely well solo. It actually feels like it was designed as a solo game and they added in additional players. Though I gotta admit, solo, it's hard not to peek at some previously researched cards if you're trying to be a purist. Now, for one, you or your group are going to have to enjoy cooperative games and games that can lend themselves to alpha games. If you don't like alpha gamers at your table, you probably want to skip this game completely. You're also going to have to enjoy games with a memory element, unless, of course, you just totally ignore that rule. And you're going to have to be willing to deal with some physical fiddling, both during setup and play, even if you've got counters. Now, if you haven't been scared away yet, I think this could be a great game for you or your group. So definitely not for those with some dexterity limitations, and probably not for folk with visual restrictions as well, I guess. Yeah, I would, I would say definitely. Um, text on the cards is big. The icons are pretty clear, but still, there, there may be some color issues that I'm not aware of as well. Now, if you or your group love puzzles and deduction games, this is a game you're going to want to check out. It's because it's unique. It's very different. This isn't a Chronicle of Crimes. This isn't an exit game. It's a very different type of deduction game. And it's not social deduction. There's no traitors. There's no betrayer to worry about in this game. This is definitely a different style of puzzle game. And it's very different from anything else I played. Here's where the stuff like the fiddly bits and the complicated setup actually shine because they allow it to provide such a unique puzzle to solve every game. And while there is replayability built into this already, it seems from what I can uh, see about it, that expansions uh, to give you even more are certainly possible. Yep. 
But of course, if the game doesn't see enough support in Kickstarter, we may never see those to uh, to see the expansion. Yeah, it's very well. In one year's time, we could be talking about a this didn't happen again or this didn't happen yet. That is possible. Now, the other place I encourage people to check this game out are your time travel, France, whatever method of time travel that may be. Uh, while it's a pretty abstract game overall, there are a lot of interesting mechanics that only really work thematically because it's a time travel game. Like being able to research anything that happened in your era before the period you were in, right? Makes sense. You could go to the library. You can look up historical records. You can read the news. You could look it up on your lunar cell phone and find out what happened. I, the ability to cash items is fantastic, right? It's the Bill and Ted thing. It's a, I drop this here so that another character can get it later. That's perfect. And while the whole cascade effect of changing one simple thing, like, trust me, the first time you change something in medieval era, ooh, there's way too much stuff that can change before you get to the end of the timeline there. Yeah, it's, I would say it feels more for the Back to the Future Bill and Ted fans than for Doctor Who fans when it comes to time travel. But it's definitely in there. Yeah, I think it's a different kind of Who. The, once you start reading the events, that's where I got the Who feel. Um, there's definitely some background that went into this game that I'm curious about. Um, what are they? I'm trying the lunar children. There, there's a faction in the lunar era that, that obviously is doing all kinds of bad things that keep coming up in the event cards. And you often run into other time travelers or yourself. Uh, you meet yourself often on the cards. That gave me a Doctor Who feel more than the mechanics and changing the timeline. Now, personally, what I am really looking forward to seeing is what happens with this. What, where is this didn't happen going to go? Is it going to turn out like this I, with, with a little bit more spit and polish? I would love to see that. I want to see what the new card quality is. I would love to see a more clarified rule book. I, I want to see what this can become. Because I like what it is now. It just feels like it just needs that little bit more to make it even more engaging and more accessible to more people. I look forward to checking this out when it goes live on Kickstarter in the new year. Well, that's it for our preview of This Didn't Happen. Feel free to also check out Mo's written review over on the blog at tabletopbellhop.com. Well, and now the Bellhop's Tabletop, where we look back at the games we played since last episode. So obviously in preparation for our review tonight, we've been playing multiple games at different player counts with different people of this didn't happen. Overall experience with this one has been quite the roller coaster. Like I honestly went from being completely lost reading the rules. And I'm sure, like I said, I'm trying to give it succinct. And I think most people listening to our last segment are probably just as lost to pretty much a complete disaster of our first game with the game literally taking longer to set up than it did to play uh, to actually really enjoying it, especially after figuring out the core loop, right? The, how you're meant to play this game. That's what's missing in the rule book. The rule book needs a little section at the beginning that says, Hey, this is a puzzle game. This is not an experiment to see what happens. game." And then having figured that out, Having played it with Tori and Kat, Deanna and I playing it, be able to go and present it to Brenda as a new player, knowing what was going on, and it just played so much more smoothly. I guess we still have the fiddliness, we still have the problem. Like there is a, a, a definite problem if it's it's supposed to be a memory game, right? Well, when you're laying out the cards, you see them. Someone is going to see them at least once. So you're not supposed to remember anything from when you set up the game. But if you're putting all the cards down, then putting other cards on top, like there's that instant where you're you're going to see those symbols. So I strongly recommend, and the book is in this order, you don't develop the apocalypse till after. So you don't know what symbols you're looking for. Because then it's really easy. Because that is the thing that we found was easy to do, was the watch for the key symbols. Like, yeah. I know there's a sword there, there, and there. I don't know what else is there, but I know the swords are there, there, and there. Right. Yeah, it's, it's intriguing. But while I love the theme, the game itself, without having played, admittedly, uh, I have to say I'm still pretty skeptical about it. I, I, this one's not going to win any awards. I will say that. And it, but it wasn't terrible. I, and it was so much better than our first impression. Um, I'm always impressed when we get a game where we try it once. And we're like, oh, no, it's fine. And we try it again. We're like, oh, okay. And then, then it clicks, right? We, we get that, oh, this is what we're supposed to be doing. And like, oh, this is actually kind of neat. There's some cool stuff going on. 
but man, I hate stacking those cards and picking them up. And I still haven't figured out which way you're supposed to tuck the cards to show that the, it's been shored up or not. Yeah, this is a game that actually, in a way, reminds me about what we were talking about last week with the burden of the game teacher. Because this is a game that definitely benefits from a teacher who's made that leap, who, who's figured out that core loop. Just knowing what you should be doing made such a huge difference in our future gameplay experiences. And I actually feel really bad for introducing this to Tori and Kat without D and I playing it once first. Usually we'll sit down and play two player first and then introduce the game. But that one game now, I was like, ah, let's try this new game. Oh, that was a bad choice. <laughs> Hopefully uh, a revised rule book will help a lot with that. So next up, sticking with more review preparation, we have been playing a lot of Land vs. Sea from Good Games Publishing. Um, enough plays that I think I actually forgot to log some on Board Game Geek because we often play multiple sections in the same night when we're playing it. Um, so in addition to more two-player games, Dan and I, uh, we have played a game with Brenda and the kids, which actually went over pretty well. Um, my youngest found it a bit difficult, but my oldest rather liked it, and Brenda, I guess, I loved it. So far, I'm actually thinking this is best at four. Now, that said, I still haven't tried it with three. Uh, we were expecting to do that Sunday, but my youngest was like, can I play? And we fit her in. I thought we were totally doing a three-player game that time, but the kids are like, we want to play, we want to play. So it ended up being four-player. Um, I, I am surprised by how well that played. That whole waypoint mechanic is just so brilliant. Now, assuming I can get in a few three-player games before next week and we can get Sean to play it online because this is on Tabletop Simulator. I haven't even checked it out yet. I would love to get our full review up next week. That's my goal. Sales uh, pending, sales, uh, I'm, I can't remember the word I want to use. Sales notwithstanding, I think is what I was thinking. Sales notwithstanding, hopefully we can get that played digitally. Um, maybe we can open that up. I haven't heard from John or Courtney in quite some time. They've kind of vanished. I hope they're both okay. Maybe we can reach out to them and see if we can get a four-player going with them, too. I'm still looking forward to this one, and I wish I had time to try it at two, three, and four players uh, before the what? review, because it really does sound interesting. I think we could probably fit it in. The problem is that there's three optional scoring methods. So like you need to play it at two, then you need to play it at two again with reefs, and then you need to play it at two with caravans, and then you need to play it at two with waypoints. And then really you should be mixing and matching those, trying it with caravans and waypoints and trying it with like, that's where, why we've been playing this one so much because each does have a very different feel. And this is definitely not a play it a couple times and you, you've discovered all there is to see. Now the other game or games, I don't know, the other series of games we have been playing a lot of lately is Adventuria. Um, I've got Deanna hooked again. Not that she ever fell away, but we kind of put this one aside for a little while and we've broken it back out. And I got to say, this game is so good. Like the more we explore this game and the more expansion content we open up and add to it, the better it gets. So this past weekend, we played through and completed the entire long adventure in Ship of Lost Souls. And man, was it good. For one, one of the things we've been complaining about is tone, perfectly PG. Uh, there was, of course, violence. There was stuff to fight. There was there were things happening, um, but it was back to the kind of whimsical feel. Um, there's a very Pirates of the Caribbean vibe in this particular adventure with Ship of Lost Holes. What do you expect? But then there's still mentions of demons and stuff. So there's there's a bit of that there. That is a really solid um, expansion. Now the middle fight. And the chaos that led up to it was amazing. Now, this one, I'm really tempted to, to steal that encounter. Because whoever came up with this, like, we've been told that a bunch of these adventures are from old RPG adventures. Man, whoever came up with, with the, the, this thing <laughs> was brilliant. And I got to say, if you stick around for the after show, I may just spoil this one. At the very end, it'll be the last thing we talk about, so you can skip it, just in case you pick this up. And yes, I, I admit, you can't pick this up. I there's worldwide shipping delays there's kickstarter issues this has not these were released in north america years ago but the second printing hasn't hit it's a mess i'll admit it it's a total mess and i feel bad for hyping this game so often when you can barely find it but it's coming so i want to save this as evergreen content so i'll save the spoilers for the very end yeah and this is just such a good game i wish more of the character decks mm -hmm. and expansions and things we're on Tabletop Simulator because I know I can't get down there 
to be playing it as much yeah. as I would love to. I guess we could potentially do it on tabletop simulator where you're stuck with the basic heroes. Well, that's the but, thing. But you're do a hybrid, right? Do a hybrid. So I'm reading off the things and we would just have the the other cards, right? Yeah. Or the henchmen that no, yeah, the well, no, I wouldn't don't work. Yeah, I just really because yeah, it just doesn't work. They need more they need more content on tabletop. Like simulator. technically you could if you started up the, the tabletop simulator but didn't start a game. And you I could play, play with your deck. Yeah, I could play with the Like, rogue. just use that. You'd have the cards for the deck. You could just do the deck part. We'd have to do everything else on our end, probably with some kind of top-down camera showing it. <laughs> I think it could be done, but honestly, it's a lot yeah, of work. That's a lot of work. That's absolutely. Uh, finally, I am still trying to get through as many games as I can on my personal pile of shame, uh, balancing that with our obligations. And to that end, I finally got to try Walking in Verano. This one's going to rival to Kaido for Zen game themes. Here you are working to build a block of colorful buildings in the Verano district of Venice. You're trying to build five colorful three-story houses out of cards to feature a diverse mix of features, I guess we'll call them. There's pedestrians walking in front and red and blue awnings and street lights and plants and two types of flowers and cats. Yes, cats. Each time you finish a full building of three stories, you're going to have someone come look and check it out. Now, you're going to decide if it's a resident or a tourist. Now, tourists just want to look at your building. They walk over and they look for the thing they like, and they're going to give you points if they see the thing you like. Residents, though, care about the whole block because they live there, right? They're a resident of that area. They're going to look for all of your buildings for a certain thing. Now, each person, of course, is looking for different things, right? So Santa is looking for chimneys. Yes, there's Santa and cats. The florist is looking for flowers. The policeman wants those streetlights to be evenly spaced and so on. Yeah, I just edited the unboxing for this today, and it looks so wholesome and yeah. fun while still not being simplistic. Yes. Yeah, this is one I actually knew quite a bit about before picking it up. So I kind of knew what I was in for, but I wasn't expecting just how many ways there are to score points and how many features there are. Then there's the fact my copy actually came with an expansion with three more types of people, three more visitors. And what's fascinating that Deanna and I both found this is there's literally too much to keep track of. There, there are too many features. You kind of have to narrow in and focus on one or two. Like you just kind of like, okay, I see a bunch of buildings with awnings. And there's the, the old lady who wants pairs of red and blue awnings over the block. So I'm going to kind of focus on that while also looking for cats for this person. But then you just kind of lose track and you're like, oh, I'm finishing this building. Well, who's going to come visit this? Oh, this person likes plants. There's lots of plants. Like it, it's literally part of the game, which actually has you like, I don't know. And then there's the Takedo thing. There are a number of the residents, specifically the residents, not the, not the tourists, that are limited in number. And there's like one of each. So if you notice your opponent has a ton of chimneys, you're going to want to recruit Santa just to screw them over. And you get that whole Takedo like, no, oh, I can't believe you got that. I, did you see that I had these? You know, plus you might not want to do that because stealing the points from them may not be worth not getting a visitor to your area. Oh, it's, it's really well done and really neat. Yeah, I expect this one will also do really well on Board Game Arena if it mm -hmm. ever gets added there. This just seems like a really good game for that. Oh, uh, I, I agree. I, I see no reason it shouldn't be digital yet. I don't know if it's a popularity thing or not, but I think it would work really well. So at this point, though, like I'm kind of raving about it. I played once. All right. So this is why this is not a full review. It's an endorsement after one play. And I've only played with two people. So at this point, Joaquin and Burano, there's still a lot more to discover. Again, this is not Pile of Obligation. I may or may not do a full review, but I will continue to talk about it here if we do play more. Now, speaking of Board Game Arena, they just today added Emotep. Mm -hmm. So with our love for that game, I expect a few games of it will be happening over the coming weeks as we learn the interface that they've got there. I know already, I got to say, this is a real-time game. I am not <laughs> enjoying it turn-based. You don't do enough on your turn. Like I put a cue boat. Now I got to wait half an hour to see what you do or longer. I, I am so far not liking the turn-based Imhotep. It's just too much time between people taking action. Fair. I, I think this might be one that we save for actual plays when we're all live. I think it'll play much better. 
So it looks great. Like it looks like they they physically did a great job of creating Imhotep. But we still haven't even moved any blocks on any <laughs> monuments yet. So we'll see how that goes. And you can play A's, B's, or random, which is why well, actually yeah. I think I went up with random on this one. Yeah, so. I was saying it must be because yeah. Does and it have is, the expansion or no? There is an expansion. I didn't select it, but there is. Okay. Uh, it does have the ability to turn on the expansion. Nice. So that's impressive. I'm just not so far. I'm not loving it turn based, but we'll see. Fair. Well, how about a look ahead? What do you have planned for the coming weeks? Uh, so as mentioned a bit ago, I got to get land versus sea with three. Um, based on how well four player works, I'm expecting good things. Uh, Galaxy Strucker is still Strucker. Galaxy Truck Galaxy Strucker is like a Marvel thing, right? Struckers one. Of, can't remember who Strucker was. He was a military guy. Anyway, Galaxy Trucker is still at the top of my two playlist as far as obligation goes. And while we're on a big Aventuria kick that I don't expect to stop anytime soon. Now, along with that, I do have some stuff to unbox that our fans would have gotten to see during the after show, as well as some packages incoming from the Op and Stonemeyer Games, both companies we've worked with in the past, and I'm pleased to announce we're working with again. Now, I also want to get some more games off my personal pile of shame. Um, at this rate, hopefully before some of this new stuff shows up, on the top of that pile right now is a game called Scurvy Dice which is a dice-based game where you roll a bunch of dice Yahtzee style, but then build the ship. And then you battle other people's ships that are built out of dice. It sounds really neat. And man, I, ever since unboxing Salsa, I have been itching to try Concordia with it, but it's been so long since I played Concordia that becomes a bigger thing because I need to play Concordia again so I can remember the base game before I throw in Salsa. So that, that just ends up every time we're sitting down to play, like, do you want to play Concordia twice? And I was like, eh, I'd rather play a couple other things. So I don't know, um, main reason too for that is it's a big, annoying sized box, and I know the expansion will fit in the base box, because if you watch our unboxing, which may or may not be live, I can't remember yet, uh, there's a lot of air in that box. Like, it's a ridiculous size for what you get inside of there. So I want to get that stuff into the core box, which, yes, I know I could just dump it in, but I have a thing about the pile of shame games go on the pile, and the games I play go on the show. <laughs> now a quick shout out. And a thank you to some of our VIP guests, our Patreon backers. We greatly appreciate their support. Brian Kurtz. Thanks, Brian. Yuho Rutila. Thank you. Jeff Seuss. Love seeing the interaction on the Discord. Kevin Reno. Thanks, Tech. Though you can never stay till the end of the show lately, but at least you're working. Timothy Smith. Thank you, Timothy. Well, that was the double bell. That means my shift is coming to an end, and we're going to have to lock those front doors. Though the doors to the lobby are closed, you can always find us all over the web as Tabletop Bellhop, one word, including our website at tabletopbellhop.com. Find our podcast on your podcatcher of choice. Sign up for the newsletter at tabletopbellhop.com slash new... No. Oh. Sign up for the newsletter at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com for weekly updates and links down below, which will be better than what, what I had to say. <laughs> Newsletter dot tabletop. Come on, we paid for that like uh, <laughs> quick ability to get to our newsletter, or uh, or you can just go to the web page. There's like a thing you can click on the side. I think for us, our, I don't even know. We changed up the site so much. Oh, there's something quick I want to mention. I do apologize for any outages on our website. We had some weird WordPress update issues. They should all be fixed now. Now, if you do dig the content we're providing, would like to support our continued efforts and keep us coming back week after week and incrementally improving the show, please consider tipping your bellhops at patreon.com slash tabletop bellhop, where you can also get access to cool bonus content. And I'll just leave it at that. Well, that wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For the lobbyists, thanks for joining us. And be sure to stick around and join us in the penthouse suite for the after show and stop by Sundays for Brunch on YouTube. For Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. I'm Mo. Thank you. And, and game, game on. on.